Welcome to Business Setup and Marketing in the Real Estate Basics course. We sincerely hope that you're reviewing the material you've learned in these lessons and are out applying the techniques and strategies that match up with the end result you're looking for. As you work through the action items addressed in each lesson, you step ever closer to achieving your goals as a real estate investor. As you continue to stay focused, work hard, and rely on the information provided in these lessons, you will find great success. Today's lesson covers an essential step in the process of making money, how to set up and market your real estate business. Now, before beginning this lesson, you should have completed the following action items for the contracts and offers lesson. One, you should have chosen two to four properties on which to make an offer. Two, locate and review three to four different purchase contracts. Three, practice writing two to three contracts. And four, present offers on at least two properties. If you haven't already done so, please take the time to complete these action items before moving forward. In this lesson, Jan and Bob will cover seven key points to starting a business. They will begin by teaching you about setting up and registering your business, setting up necessary contact options for your business, determining your marketing objectives, evaluating and selecting appropriate marketing techniques for your target area, getting referrals, creating a marketing plan and budget, and lastly, recognizing common marketing mistakes you'll want to avoid. You know, treating real estate investing like a business can sometimes be the difference between success and failure. For example, a person could be a great chef, but that doesn't mean they can run a successful restaurant. As investors, we have to be able to find good deals, line up the financing or buyers, properly manage our time, etc. So this will be a great opportunity to learn how to become a more effective and efficient investor. Before you begin this lesson, please take the time to print out the workbook file. Also, have a pen and paper ready so you can take notes on the points you want to remember. Now, let's begin. Since we're talking about marketing today, Jan, I thought I would share a simple six-step process for developing a clear marketing plan. The first step is to decide exactly what you want to accomplish with your marketing. Rather than thinking about the perks and benefits that come with success, Focus instead on identifying the purpose of your actions. This might be a specific type of sale, like a foreclosure or tax lien certificate, or it could be a specific audience, like out-of-state owners. Ask yourself, what elements do I want in a prospective deal? As you answer this question, be very specific. Write your thoughts and notes in clear detail. Finish this step by creating a list of goals that you want to accomplish. The second step is to decide who your target audience is. Who are you trying to sell to? And what do you know about them? Write down everything you know about their common characteristics, age, income, and interests. This will be a big help as you try to decide what you should emphasize or focus on with your marketing efforts. Third, come up with a list of steps to go along with your marketing goals. Besides figuring out exactly what you want to achieve, Knowing how you will do it is also vital. Think about the end result you want to create, and then consider exactly what you'd need to do in order to achieve it. Write each step in order, and make a note of any possible obstacles you may face, along with the actions you should take to overcome them. The fourth step is to come up with an approximate timeline for reaching your marketing goals. Think about how long it should take for each goal or step to be completed. Develop a general plan for when you should complete each one. Fifth, create a plan for completing the actions you've identified. Consider questions such as, will all the steps be undertaken at once, or is there a clear progression to follow? If a delay or obstacle comes up, will that change the order of the steps? Prepare and plan ahead as much as possible. Once you get to this point, you can start working on the first steps. Once you're moving forward, you'll want to set aside some time to evaluate your progress and readjust your goals and plans if circumstances have changed or if something is not working. You can do this as frequently as needed in order to ensure that you are staying on track. There is a worksheet at the beginning of the Business Setup and Marketing chapter of your workbook where you can record your initial thoughts, goals, and plans for marketing your business. We will go over the process for developing a marketing plan in more detail later in this lesson. One of the first decisions you need to address when it comes to setting up your business 
is what you will call your business. Many people have a hard time deciding on a business name, and rightly so. After all, it is an important decision. It will be the way people reference and identify you as a business. However, do not let choosing your business name stand in the way of proceeding with your investing career. For those of you who may be having a hard time deciding on a business name, let me offer some suggestions. The first bit of advice is that you include some words in the name that give an indication as to what you do or how you can help people. You might consider using words like investments, investors, solutions, ventures, or remedies. For example, you could choose something like quick home solutions or home remedies as your business name. On the other hand, you should avoid words that are typically associated with people with some kind of license, such as agent, broker, realty, or banker. You also might consider using something familiar to your area, such as a tourist attraction, a national monument, a mountain range, or a well-known lake or river. For example, you may consider something like Rocky Mountain Property Ventures or Pikes Peak Home Investors. Finally, some people suggest using your name or initials in your business name, but I do not recommend this. You want to keep a certain distance between you and your business to maintain your privacy and a strong corporate shield in case something ever goes wrong. We've also put some additional assistance and forms in the workbook to help you brainstorm, select a business name, and go through the other steps involved in setting up your business. After deciding on a name for your business, the next step is to decide what type of business works best for you. Many people feel that setting up a business is intimidating and somewhat overwhelming, but with the aid of this lesson, you will find it is nothing to be feared. Setting up a business is very important in the investing world because it helps protect your current and future wealth from potential lawsuits and excessive taxation. There are a number of different business types from which to choose. Many real estate investors actually use a combination of businesses to protect all their assets. While multiple entities at this stage of your investing journey might be extreme, it is something to keep in mind as you become more successful. Some of the options to consider include a limited liability company or LLC, a limited liability partnership or LLP, a C corporation or an S corporation. Each of these entities offers different levels of asset protection and different tax regulations. For example, limited liability companies and partnerships are relatively easy to set up and maintain and offer great asset protection. S or C corporations, on the other hand, are more difficult to establish and also provide less asset protection. Most states also allow sole proprietorships and general partnerships, but I do not recommend using either of these since they offer essentially no asset protection. You will want to choose one of the previous four, but each state differs as to how they need to be registered and what respective fees are associated with each. I suggest you sit down with a local attorney or tax advisor to figure out which type best fits your specific needs, circumstances, and business objectives. That is an excellent suggestion, Bob. My accountant gave me some great advice when I was setting up my business. Once you have determined your business name and type, it is time to actually register it with the government. Each state has different regulations that specify exactly what you need to do in order to register a business. I suggest you also review these requirements with your accountant or attorney. Also, keep in mind that some areas require that you register with local business oversight agencies as well. In these areas, you may be able to register with your local authority and the state at the same time. After you register with the state, you will receive a certificate to do business in that state. You can then go to the irs.gov website to obtain an EIN, or Employee Identification Number. This number is essentially the social security number for your business. You will use it to report income each year. Just as with your social security number, you can establish a credit rating with lenders for your business under your EIN. The best part is that you can then apply with lenders or creditors for 
corporate credit. Once you have registered your business, you should start setting up the specific features of the business. One of the first things to decide on is how people are going to contact you. Some of this will be determined by what you have chosen as your target market. For example, if your target market is outside your calling area, you may consider getting a toll-free number. If your target market is within your calling area, you need to ask yourself if you want people calling your home phone. It definitely sounds more professional to have someone answering a business call by announcing the name of the business rather than just answering as you normally do on your home line. If you want to get a toll-free number or look into other business telephone services, go to the website call8.com. Make sure you spell it with a K and not a C. Youreach.com is another good one to check out. Again, make sure you spell that with just a U and not Y-O-U. Some people prefer to communicate by email rather than by telephone, so you need to consider providing an email address as well. I would suggest using one that only you can access to make sure that no one can go into it and accidentally delete an important message. When you are coming up with an email address, I recommend that you use your business name or your name. Doing so will make it easier for people to remember. Give your business a more professional look by registering an email alias. This is an email address that shows your business name instead of just some common email service. For example, instead of having an email address of realestatepro at hotmail.com, you could have bob at realestatepro.com. This is just a small detail, but it does add a certain level of professionalism and credibility to your business. You can easily obtain one of these email aliases by registering a normal email through gmail.com and then going to the Accounts tab and adding a new email. Another factor to consider with your business contact information is whether to use your home address in your correspondence. Some people may feel more confident working with someone if they know there is a physical address associated with the business. If you do not feel comfortable using your home address, you can get a post office box at mailboxes, etc., or the UPS store. They do charge monthly fees for these post office boxes, but these costs are tax deductible as business expenses. Many techniques are available for marketing your business. Some are more effective than others for different target markets and different investment strategies. For this reason, you should evaluate the different options, how much they cost, and whether your target audience is likely to see them. I suggest you take advantage of the space in the marketing techniques section of your workbook to take notes on the techniques we are going to discuss. Once you have identified your business name and objectives, you are ready to come up with a catchy slogan. For example, if I say Coca-Cola, what comes to mind? Easy, the Coke side of life. Give me another one. Okay, if I say Subway sandwiches, what comes to mind? I haven't eaten yet, but you're right, the slogan Eat Fresh comes to mind as well. Exactly. A good slogan makes people think of the product being offered. The slogan you create should describe in more detail than your name what your business does and how it does it. For example, your slogan for buying homes might read, We buy houses fast, or we buy homes in 14 days for cash, or the slightly more catchy, top dollar for your home. You may also consider different slogans for selling the homes you buy. For example, we can help you own a home today, or a small down payment gets you a home, or again, the slightly catchier solutions for your home buying blues. So use your creativity and come up with a good slogan that you can include on business cards, flyers, and other marketing pieces. Once you have set up your business and created your slogan, it's time to get some business cards. The card should include your name, business name, slogan, business phone number, email address, as well as your fax number and website, if you have them. The goal is to have a card to give to everyone you talk to. We will talk more of how to use business cards later in this lesson. But for now, let's look at some of the tips for business cards and how to get them. The first thing is to make sure that all of your information is clear and correct. 
The cards are only beneficial if the person receiving it can get back in touch with you at a later date. So you will want to double check to be sure that all of your contact information is correct and current. Second, keep in mind that you can print on both sides of the card. You can use one side for contact information and the other for extra marketing space, say for a referral program. For example, on the back of one of my business cards I say, do you know someone who has bad credit but wants a home? I'll give you $500 when your referral buys from me. Call now. And then I put a phone number. It costs a little more to use both sides of the card, but it has the potential to make more money as well. We will talk more about how to get and use referrals later in the lesson. A third idea is to use more than one set of cards. One set might target home sellers, for example, while another would be geared towards home buyers. Consider using colored paper or colored fonts on your cards. The color will draw more attention to your card and get people to look at it more often. Be careful with this, though. Too much color can make your cards look cheap and gaudy. Another option might be to consider using a fold-over or larger-than-normal card. This can bring more attention to the card as well, but again, you want to be careful because if your card does not fit into a Rolodex or other business card holder, it might be thrown away. When you've decided on how you want your card to look, you have a lot of options as to where to get them designed and printed. Literally hundreds of websites provide business card services. Go to google.com and type business cards in the search box to shop online. You may have local printing shops as well that you can contact. Shop around and compare services and prices to make sure you're getting the best deal available. In addition, you can buy software that helps you create and print business cards on your home computer. If you have a quality printer, this might be a good option. Eventually, though, I recommend you hire a professional to design and print your cards simply to ensure the highest quality. After all, your business cards represent your business and they should be as professional as possible. Classified ads, either online or in printed materials, are one of the more effective marketing techniques available. There are national as well as local online classified ad listings. Ads in the local daily newspapers will cost more than ads in the weekly papers, so it might be more cost-effective for you to start with the weekly papers. You'll want to see where these papers are distributed and find out if they reach your target areas effectively or not. In most cases, you will find that these newspapers, both daily and weekly, place their information online as well. They might run it for free or for a little more than the cost of the ad in the printed newspaper. Many websites offer free classified ad listing services. In most cases, you will find that they will allow you to upload pictures and text sufficient to market what you have to offer the public. A lot of them cover specific areas. You can find them by going to google.com and searching for free classified ads or free classifieds with the name of a city or state to which you are targeting your marketing. Posting signs is another excellent technique when you are buying, renting, or selling a property. Signs can be posted right on the sale or rental property, as well as on nearby roadsides and corners. Some may simply be directional signs showing where the property is located. You might also consider posting signs at busy intersections, advertising that you buy homes or can help stop foreclosure. Before placing these signs, be sure you know the local regulations controlling where the signs can be placed. Another marketing technique to consider is direct mail. Direct mail is anything sent by the post office to a potential buyer or seller. You can send postcards, flyers, or traditional letters. This technique carries a bit more cost, but it can also be very effective. For example, let's assume you are focusing on the buy and hold strategy and you see a vacant home. You could get the mailing address of its owner and send a letter explaining the costs involved in holding on to a vacant property. You would also explain your services and ask the owner to call you for help in alleviating their financial liability. We will discuss the details on how to effectively create and distribute direct mail pieces in your financing and foreclosure courses. Another great technique is to market in person. This is where the professional business cards come into play. Give those cards to everyone you talk to, especially those you talk to about real estate. You may also want to print up some nice brochures 
and describe what you can do and hand them out or leave them at doctor's offices or car repair shops or anywhere people have to sit and wait. You should also consider giving them to real estate professionals in your target areas so they can refer their clients to you. As an example of this kind of marketing, let's assume you are focusing on foreclosures. It is very important to get marketing pieces in front of someone facing foreclosure at the right time. So when you find someone who is about to lose their home, you can deliver a brochure describing the pain and embarrassment they may suffer as a result of the foreclosure and then offer your services as a solution to their problem. You can increase the effectiveness of any of the marketing techniques by including a referral option with your materials whenever possible. Most people who see your marketing will not have an immediate need for your services, so you want to make it easy for them to refer your services to someone else who does need them. Remember, a referral can come from anyone, a friend, colleague, family member, real estate professional, or even a stranger. So it is in your best interest to let everyone you meet know what you do. Among real estate professionals, you should consider networking with real estate agents, mortgage brokers, title or closing agents, appraisers, and real estate attorneys. Other good sources for referrals are accountants, attorneys, local bankers, and other real estate investors. We will discuss these people and marketing to them in more detail in the Marketing and the Real Estate Alternatives lesson. The key point here is that referrals will make your life a lot easier. They are one of the best ways to work smarter, not harder. One of the most important things you can do to get referrals is to get your information in front of people. That information can be in the form of signs, posters, flyers, letters, or business cards. It is also important that the material be short and specific as to what you are offering. Tell people why it is good to refer you. It might be an extra added service or benefit that their current clients can use. Also, consider giving a referral bonus or some other incentive for the person who gives you a referral. An essential part of a referral program is to have something that a person can take with them. You have probably seen signs and flyers with tear-off strips or stacks of brochures and business cards in waiting areas. What item the person takes is not as important as the fact that they take something that reminds them of who you are and what you do. Another vital aspect of referrals is to follow up with the people being referred as well as the person who did the referring. Set aside some time each week or every other week to contact your referral sources and follow up with them. During these contacts, reinforce your incentive and encourage them to refer someone. When you have the chance to choose your referral sources, say by handing out business cards or networking at real estate investors clubs, there are some qualities you want to look for to help you decide if the person is a good candidate to be a referral source. First, try to find out if the person has a good relationship with people in your target market. The person might be a prominent public figure in an area or their profession might put them in contact with people in bad credit situations, for example. The referral source should have a good understanding of your ideal client. Whether it is someone with bad credit, with little money, or needing to sell a home, your referral source should understand what you're looking for. The referral source should also be fairly knowledgeable about what you are able to do. You do not want to waste time with referrals for things you really can't help them with. This would include things like legal issues or other potential problems. They should also be motivated to provide referrals. That motivation might be in the form of a bonus of some kind. They might have friends or family who need your help, or your services may be a service they want to provide their own clients in a professional capacity. Jan, I have a few final tips for our friends to consider. The first one is that you include an email address on every marketing piece you create, both online and off. More and more people prefer the convenience of communicating by email and you will get more responses if that is always an available option. The second tip is that you carefully consider where you put your ads. What I mean by this is to make sure the ads you use are put in the best places for your target market. For example, if you are targeting people who are financially strapped and need to sell a home to pay off their debt, 
then the most expensive local paper might not be the best place to advertise. And putting rent-to-own signs in the upscale neighborhoods might not bring the best results either. Just think about where the marketing will be most effective and then try some things out for a month or so to see how they work. Here's another tip, Bob. Provide targeted, quality ad copy. Ad copy is the fancy name given to the text you put on a marketing piece. Writing good ad copy is a skill that you can develop over time. If you are not confident in your writing abilities, just look around at some of your competitors' marketing pieces. Read them, underline parts that grab your attention, and then try to emulate that kind of writing for your own marketing. While you are doing this, keep focused on where your ad will be seen and who will see it. For example, if your target market is a college town and you are focusing on young college buyers, you might say something like, we have many great starter homes just blocks from ABC College. Contact us today to help you get into your first home. Bad credit is okay. And then list your phone number and email. The first step in developing your marketing plan is to identify the target areas in which you want to market. You may have completed this step and the worksheet shown here as part of the action items in the What to Look For lesson. The next step is to identify the target audience, market conditions and investment strategy you want to focus on in each target area. For instance, you might focus on young families in an area where market conditions are slowing with a lot of foreclosures using a cash flow investment strategy. I suggest you take a break from this lesson to complete the Target Area Features Worksheet in the Marketing Plan section of your workbook. Identifying this information now will help a lot as you start thinking about what to put in your marketing plan. Once you have identified your target areas, audiences, market conditions, and investment strategies, you are ready to start answering the questions that will guide the creation of your marketing plan. Let's go through each of the questions in the marketing questionnaire. When we finish, you will want to answer them for yourself. The first question is a simple one. Who is the target of your marketing? Based on the work you have already done, I would say that your initial target groups are the buyers and sellers in your target audiences. The next questions to consider are the financial ones. For instance, how much can I afford to spend to start marketing? And where will my marketing money come from? And how much of the budget do I want to allocate to the different target areas and groups? You may have a very limited amount of money currently available, so you need to know exactly how much you can afford to spend. Keep in mind, that at this early stage your marketing plan is not set in stone. You are simply identifying a starting point. You will change and update the plan on a regular basis as you see what works and what doesn't. Next, make a preliminary decision on which techniques will work best to reach each of your target audiences. Are they likely to see and respond to classified ads, flyers, postcards, or something else? In many cases, you will not know exactly, and that is okay. The main thing is to just make your best guess based on what you know of the area and then test it to see if it works. Keep in mind that your marketing plan may well contain a variety of different techniques that you will use in specific areas under different circumstances. For instance, ABC Street may be best suited for flyers that focus on selling a home in 14 days or less. XYZ City, on the other hand, may be a great place to use online ads to find young families who want to buy homes with little or no money down. As you make this decision, you can start doing research to find the resources that you will use with each of these techniques. Look for ones that give the best deal so that your marketing dollars stretch as far as possible. As you identify those that are most affordable, you can figure out what you can spend on each one over the course of a month. Record that on the questionnaire. The fourth step is to make some predictions as to the kind of response you will get. A response of 1 or 2 percent is considered about average. You can also get some good information on the likely results from the various marketing techniques from other investors or marketing professionals in your area. 
you will compare your actual results each month with these predictions and then change the allocation of your funds if necessary to get a lower cost per lead. Finally, identify the keywords and slogans that you will use in your marketing. You may have already done this when we discussed it earlier in the lesson. As you go through the marketing and foreclosure courses, you will find that there are specific keywords you should consider using depending on the focus of your marketing efforts. You can find this marketing questionnaire in the marketing plan section of your workbook. Fill it out for each of your target areas and groups because the techniques and costs for each will be different. It is very important that you devote the time it takes to gather this information and answer these questions. The better the foundation of information that you assemble, the better chance you have that your marketing efforts will result in profitable deals. There are three main parts to your marketing plan. The basic plan, the schedule, and the evaluation. The basic plan contains general information for each target area and is based on the information you have gathered on the demographics worksheet and the target area features worksheet. First list each of your target areas in the row across the top. In the next row, list the groups you are targeting. Normally this will be buyers or renters and sellers, although it could also include investors and networking contacts. In the next row, list the specific techniques you plan to use for each group and target area. Below these, put the name of the person or company who will produce the material, how long it will take, and how long you plan to run the ad or sign, or how frequently you plan to distribute the information. In the responses row, put the number of responses you think you will get. We understand you will be guessing at the first round, but as you start marketing you will get a better idea of what to expect. Later when the campaign is ended, record the number you actually received. In the transactions row, mark a tally to record the transactions that result from the effort. In the budget row, put how much you expect it to cost, and then after you have spent the money, enter the actual cost. In the final row, put where you plan to get the money. This could be a savings account, a small business loan, or even the car you're planning to sell. Keeping this record helps you make sure that you do not spend more than you have and that you know where the money is coming from and going to. You should consider putting back into your marketing budget a portion of the proceeds from all your deals. The second part of your marketing plan is the schedule. This is where you keep track of exactly what you plan to do and when you plan to do it. You should make a schedule each month for each of your target areas. In the left column, list each of the techniques you plan to use. Then, in each weekly column, list what you plan to do to get the material published or distributed. Fill in the results and the costs columns as you receive responses, make offers, complete transactions, and incur costs. I also recommend that you create one or more rows for reminders on referrals and other tasks that you want to be sure not to forget. Finally, at the end of the month, add up the total costs of your marketing efforts. You can compute your cost per lead by dividing the total cost of a technique by the number of responses. This will help you decide which of your techniques are the most effective and most cost efficient. Finally, transfer the costs, response, and transaction information to the basic plan. As you implement your marketing plan and compute your cost per lead, you will notice that some marketing techniques cost more than others. We recommend that you evaluate your marketing efforts at the end of each month for the first several months. Once you get a good idea of what works and what doesn't, evaluating once a quarter should be sufficient. If your experience is like mine, Jan, you will discover that some techniques are not effective enough to merit continuing them, so you modify your basic plan accordingly. Also, your budget may change, either up or down, requiring a corresponding change in your plan. Reviewing your efforts regularly and making adjustments will help you stretch your funds further and provide a better return on the marketing dollars that you spend. When evaluating your plan, there are several questions you should answer. The first question is, what percent of my profit should I use on marketing? Marketing is something that never goes away, and as you make money, you need to decide how much of your profits to be put back into marketing and building your business. Question two. How frequently do I need to spend money on marketing in order to be most effective, and how much each time? Some techniques are best used once a quarter, some once a week. 
you need to know those variables and plan for them. To some degree, you will have to try different approaches to see what works best for you. A third question is, do I have the best price for the marketing technique? Do yourself a favor of shopping around and comparing prices. If you find a marketing source you really like, but another place offers the same service cheaper, ask the first service if they will match the price or reduce their price accordingly. Money talks, and if a business knows that you will take your money somewhere else, that can be a very strong negotiating tool. As a follow-up to question three, ask yourself, is there a way to reduce the cost of a marketing technique and still be effective? Sometimes you can make some of your marketing materials at home and invest time rather than money. Perhaps you could save money by sending postcards instead of letters. And the last question, is there an alternative to this marketing approach that is less expensive but just as effective? This is similar to the previous question, but instead of changing the way you produce the marketing material, you are looking to change techniques entirely for something less expensive. For example, if you are accustomed to sending out letters to potential clients, you might change tactics and telephone them instead if you can keep the same response rate. This list of questions is included in your workbook. You should go through this as part of your regular marketing evaluation to see where you can cut costs and raise profits. Remember, you should only make one change at a time to a marketing piece so that you can see the impact of your change. And be sure to use each piece long enough to see if it is working. I suggest that you wait at least a month before making a change because you may not get leads for a month or more after you send something out. And finally, make sure you save a copy of your original so you know what people are responding to. The main goal of these lessons is to provide you with the information you need to successfully market in your target areas and to make a decent profit from deals you find. Essentially, we are helping you understand how to spend money in such a way that helps you make more money. Part of that is informing you of things to avoid when you are marketing your business. There are six common mistakes that you should avoid. The first is not having a marketing plan at all. Believe it or not, Bob, some people think that they can just talk to people and buyers and sellers will flock to them. Unfortunately, this is about as likely as the tooth fairy dropping in to lay $10,000 on your pillow. You need to have a marketing plan to manage both your funds and timing since both are very important to your success in real estate. The second big mistake would be not creating a budget and sticking to it. You need to track where your money is going and how much you are making. A third mistake to avoid is not identifying strategies that work or sticking with strategies that don't work. We've taught you some good techniques in this lesson and in future lessons these techniques will be refined according to your specific marketing plan or investment strategy. But when you get into a strategy or technique that is giving you good results, don't change unless it stops performing. It is okay to test one thing at a time to see if you can be more effective, but do not change what already works. If something does not work as soon as you implement it, don't immediately jump in and change it. Let it work for at least a month before you make a change. Another mistake to avoid is to simply follow the masses and do what everyone else does. Granted, I talked about emulating ad copy from your competitors, but do not copy what they have word for word. Make your marketing yours. Let it reflect who and what you are so that you can be distinguished from the crowd. The fifth mistake to avoid is to not be persistent. You may not see immediate results from any given marketing strategy, but that does not mean it is ineffective. Continue with it for a little while to see if it is going to produce results or not. Here's an example of what you're talking about, Jan. I know an investor who sent 300 postcards to a subdivision in which she wanted to buy a home. After three weeks, she had only received a few phone calls, so she modified the postcard and sent 300 of the modified postcards to another subdivision. Well, the first batch of 300 cards eventually produced a 5% response rate, but most of the responses did not come in until more than six weeks after the initial mailing. And she got a deal out of it that produced a $25,000 profit from her investment of only $200. Not too bad. 
The second batch of 300 postcards only produced a 1.5% response rate, however. The responses came within two weeks of the mailing, but she did not get any deals from them. The moral of the story is that some responses may take a little longer and produce different results, so don't give up too soon. If you do decide to change something, just change one thing so that you can evaluate the impact of the change. In this example, my investor friend learned that the change she made did not work. The original postcard was more effective, even though it took longer to get responses. She is now planning her mailings accordingly. Excellent example, Bob. Thank you. The last mistake investors commonly make is to be just like everyone else in what they offer. If you employ some of the marketing strategies in these lessons, as well as some of the specialized techniques found in the marketing and foreclosures lessons, you will be different from others. You will have a competitive edge, but doing so will require that you step out of your comfort zone. Don't be afraid to think outside the box. For example, I recently sent handwritten postcards in blue ink to people living in a specific subdivision. I said I would pay them to sell me their home. I even offered them an extra $2,000 if they would sell their home to me instead of listing it with a real estate agent. I also said that I close quickly. You would be amazed at how many phone calls I receive from people curious to know if I would really pay them $2,000 if they would sell their home to me. It provided a great opportunity for me to tell them who I was and what I do. If we can make a deal, great. If not, I tell them that I will give them a referral fee if they refer someone to me who does close a deal. Don't choose a strategy just because everyone else is doing it. Follow the guidelines provided here. Be creative and be successful. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Business Setup and Marketing in the Real Estate Basics course. Setting up a business and marketing plan is extremely important to your success in real estate. So, based on what Jan Eliason and Bob Grimm have taught you in this lesson, over the next week you'll want to focus on the following action items. 1. Begin by choosing a business name and type, for example, an LLC, S-Corp, C-Corp, and so on. 2. Register your business with state, federal, and if necessary, local governments. 3. Set up the necessary options for others to contact your business. 4. Design and print that contact information on your business card. 5. Evaluate and then select marketing techniques for your target market. 6. Create a marketing plan and then create a marketing budget. And lastly, 7. Begin your marketing efforts by asking friends, acquaintances, and associates for referrals. Congratulations! You have now completed the Real Estate Basics course. Please feel free to go back over any of the lessons in the course to make sure you understand the concepts and are performing the tasks as directed. As we conclude, consider this statement. The successful real estate investor is willing to do that which the unsuccessful real estate investor is not willing to do. Now is the time for you to implement what you have learned and begin creating wealth by investing in real estate. We wish you great success in your real estate pursuits.